Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Linda Larson, and I am so pleased to be the host, hostess, I guess I should say, <laughs> of this amazing Hearts Talk series that was founded by Lila Amino. And uh, we have had some amazing, amazing guests on this show now for five weeks. This week, I am particularly excited about. Uh, the topic of this week is the importance of the environment. And uh, I think right now we're in a very critical time on our planet where we need all the help that we can get. Uh, we're going to be talking to some people who are right at the heartbeat of this topic, and they're going to share with us some very important information. So if you have any questions as we're going along, please feel free to pop those questions in the chat box, and I will be monitoring, monitoring those questions, and uh, as they come up, I will ask people. If we have time, we will field some questions, uh, and, and hopefully you'll be able to have your questions answered today. I'll tell you just a brief little thing about me. Uh, I, I'm a keynote speaker. I speak at large conferences around the world, and I have gotten to travel this great wide world and, uh, and be able to speak to people from many, many countries. And the most important thing for me about the environment is this. 23 and a half years ago, I married a meteorologist. He is a weatherman for a television station here in the United States. And he has a graduate degree in meteorology and he's absolutely brilliant. And for the longest time in his mind of utmost importance has been this planet and the climate and what is happening here. And so uh, he has to work right now. He's actually on TV, but he told me to send him the recording as soon as we're finished because he wants to hear from all of you. So please, with that in mind, we're very excited to talk to all of our speakers today. And let me start with Sheikha. Uh, Sheikha, I will read your introduction. Uh, you have so accomplished so much in your life that I want to make sure I try to cover as much as possible. You tell me if I've forgotten anything. Sheikha Inisar is a woman who is working towards a more positive, loving, and peaceful Arab world. She has, and these are just some, some uh, at um, signs, at Intisar's foundation, the only charity focusing on supporting the mental health of women affected by war by using drama psychotherapy to have healed and empower them to bring peace within themselves, their families, communities, and ultimately the, area wor the Arab world. At Al Anwar, 2013, the first initiative in the Middle East to take positive psychology and simplify it into easy to implement exercises and tools to develop a positive mindset. I want every bit of information on that, please, Sheikha. <laughs> um, at, at Barik, 2016, the first positive psychology school curriculum implemented in the Middle East. That is amazing. Officially part of the National Development Plan for the State of Kuwait, New Kuwait. At Prismology, the first beauty brand in the world to use color therapy to increase well-being. At Intisars, a jewelry brand that connects us to love of ourselves and empower its wearer. She is the woman behind the campaign World Cleanup Day in Kuwait. So please help me welcome Shake Up. We're so happy to have you. Please, please talk to Thank us and tell us things. Thank you so much. And this is a great honor to be in this amazing panel. And thank you so much, Amina, for this uh, opportunity. And seriously, I am just in awe of Heidi and everything she's done because of what she's done. We're able to, for the first time, uh, have World Cleanup Day in Kuwait. And we are actually announcing and shouting it's the biggest cleanup in Kuwait's history. Uh, we've been uh, very fortunate that we have a lot of ministers who've agreed to come. We're pushing for the prime minister and I think we're 50% there if not more. We have a lot of parliamentarians coming. We have a lot of dignitaries coming. We want to make this a day where everyone not only remembers the environment not only cleans the country, but also unite to work, uh, to work towards um, a more environmentally 
sustainable, clean, and uh, amazing Kuwait. And I'm so honored to be able to do it under the umbrella of Al Nuwer. And uh, the original uh, uh, idea came from Mr. Yusuf Shatti, who has been uh, cleaning around Kuwait. And he spoke to World Cleanup Day. And uh, I'm honored that he approached me to take on the umbrella of the campaign. And even he's astonished how much we could accomplish in a week. <laughs> so that's, that's what we're working on. We're working towards a more, I call it humane society because when we take care of our environment, we become more human. And well, I'll just give you a little bit brief about Nowhere. Nowhere is um, an NGO I started in 2013, basically when people didn't understand what positive psychology was, and I'm talking again in the Middle East, actually all over the world, people still were just starting to understand what positive psychology was. And what we do is we take research and all findings in positive psychology, simplify them into exercises, tools, or um, uh, anything that the lay person can take to improve their life. Uh, everyone knows 2011, uh, 12, 13. Those were very um, negative days in, in the Arab world, and uh, especially, not especially, in Kuwait too, there was a lot of disgruntled people and um, and a, a lot was happening and, and because of all the complaining, I realized, you know, something's, something has to be done. We can't just sit and complain and not do anything about it. And that's why I started Nowhere and Barir came as a, a, a branch from Nowhere. And uh, thank you for giving that small introduction. We're currently working on, we have a curriculum and we train the teachers on them. We have 470 teachers and we're currently, well, just before, uh, the COVID-19 were training the teachers to implement the program on 11,600 students and growing. Can you tell us more about that? Well, we just use, um, we, we have a new way of looking at positive psychology and values in schools. So what we do is we, we have amazing um, specialists and, and doctors in positive psychology who've been able to simplify, um, like gratitude is a big attribute of, of positive people. So how do you take gratitude and simplify it into exercises and tools that students can use in, in the classroom, in any, la in any subject, be it um, art, PE, Arabic, uh, religion, how can you make a tool that everyone can use and adapt to their subject? And we've been able to do that. We actually, within uh, starting the program, were able to uh, uh, measure the impact of the program on 1,200 students, mm -hmm. pre and post. And uh, because of the big shift within six weeks, we were able to publish it in Springer Magazine, Springer Journal, the change in the life perspective of the students. Wow, that's very impressive. What about, Sheikha, can I ask you, that gra I, I understand the power of gratitude. Have you attached that to the children's understanding and learning about the environment? Is that one of the areas? You said P, uh, Arabic and all yeah. those other topics. So what we do is, is we work only with high school because mm -hmm. for us, that's, that's the age where they really need as much support as possible. The younger ones are naturally more positive is when you get to the teenager years with all the hormones and all the thoughts in their head. So it's a, a very crucial year. So we work with only high school students. We don't include it in the environment, in the curriculum, but we do include it in the, include the environment in their activities. So we have the curriculum and we have activities and we have volunteering. So every school has to have a volunteering program and in some uh, schools, it is the environment. 
And if I may just add one more thing that um, I founded and I started and I'm really, really proud of is we use drama therapy as a means of, impact, of releasing the trauma of the women, rehabilitating them and supporting them mentally to be able to become more at peace, to be the peace agents or the ambassadors of peace within their families, their uh, communities and the Arab world. Trauma, as everyone knows now, is inherited and it's passed down to generations passed down in generations. Mm -hmm. So the aim of our foundation is to support 1 million Arab women in all of the Arab world to become the peace agents of the new Arab world because the way things are going with all the wars, we're gonna have forever wars. So we want to break the cycle of internal and external wars and make the women the agents because women can do it and women are the most vested in their future because of the children. Yes, what a powerful program and so critically important. It is. So we actually are publishing research. So all the NGOs I've started are impact driven. So we always use research and we measure the, the, you know, how much we are success with what we do. And we've, uh, we published the first research on drama therapy on Arab women. And we've started a research uh, hub within the foundation to, to know more about what makes Arab women tick, how they can be in peace, how they can promote peace. Mm -hmm. So all of that is being researched now. How do you measure the success for the women who go through the drama therapy programs? How do you measure that? We have quantitative and we have qualitative. So we're doing research on both and sometimes together and sometimes separate. So we always have pre and post. And we mm. also now are measuring the, with their families and their, and their children. Got it. And yeah. also, we're interesting fact is we've had successes with women bringing in more money when they're more empowered and more at peace. This is a, the very interesting thing that we're, we're measuring now. Do they become better entrepreneurs? Do they become more open-minded to becoming entrepreneurs? We've had success stories, so we're seeing, is it working with most women, some women, very few women? So this is our next research. That is amazing. Where can we read about your work? Where can we read I about will, that? I will put it now in the chat. I Perfect. didn't put it, I, will put, I, put the, I put new al Nuwer, I put, um, I haven't put the rest, I put Insar Foundation right now, and I'll put Bariq, which is the school curriculum. Great. Thank you so I'm, much. I'm sure we would love to know more about that. It sounds amazing what you are doing. Does anyone have any questions for Sheikha? About her work, about anything she's doing, and she's into so many different things. Anything <laughs> at all. No, no, everyone says to me, I'm in many things. But if you look at it and you look at the roots of what I'm doing, it's social behavioral change to achieve internal peace. Wow, a, a, a noble goal, a very noble mission, I would say. Something there, and, and, and it doesn't just apply to people in the Arab countries. This applies everywhere. Everywhere. Every human we all need being. it. We all, I'm, I'm, I'm Arab, so I have to start somewhere. So I start in Kuwait in the Arab world. But I mean, I mean if you look at prismology, we use color therapy to enhance mood. Again, it's how to, to achieve a better mindset, a, a more peaceful insight to be using beauty uh, products. So, and, and the same with the jewelry brand, what we do. I mean, I'm wearing my jewelry now. It's not normal jewelry. They're, we call them uh, empowering, empowerment tools, camouflage as jewelry. So we have, yeah, we have words, empowering words that when you wear either close to your skin or as, you know, if you turn it around, it becomes an affirmation. And 50% of the pro proceeds from the jewelry brand go to feed and, and uh, the foundation. So we support the women through the sales of jewelry. So if you buy a piece of jewelry, you feel good because it works within, with, with your psyche and you also make someone else feel good because you support them. And also it's an ethical brand. You are a very passionate, yes. committed, <laughs> 
woman and you are making mm -hmm. such a huge difference I in this. Hope so. Oh my <gasps> word. My God, I hope so. Imagine all of this and I don't do a difference. <laughs> What, what a shame. <laughs> oh, well, you, you know, I always say when, when, the, when my final moments come, uh, and it's my final moments on this planet, I just want to make certain that I have no regrets, that I didn't look at something that needed to be done, a right or a wrong that need to be righted. And I knew I could do it, but I didn't do it. I don't want those final moments to be filled with regrets. My dear Sheikha, you will have no regrets. You will, you will lie there thinking, I did everything I could possibly do every moment of my life. I salute I you. you are so. I hope so. I, I've been created to do something in this world. I might as well do it. So I'm really blessed and honored to be given the, the name, the status, the passion, the drive to fulfill my purpose in this life. Well, you are very inspiring. Does anyone have any other questions for her at this time? We might think of something, and if you do, okay. by all means. Oh, by the way. Can I ask you a quick question, uh, Sheikha? Sure. Cool. Thank you. Um, I would just like to know more about the community that you work with in uh, Kuwait, the, the women. Um, mm. Uh, because I've lived in Qatar, so I know there are different communities uh, in the Gulf and the Arab countries. So I'm just wondering which women, which community. Well, we don't actually work in Kuwait right now. Uh, we work currently in Jordan and Lebanon with locals and uh, uh, refugees oh, okay. and residents. Uh, the reason we don't work in Kuwait is there are no drama therapists in Kuwait. So. One of the challenges we have, well, one of the, the great things is drama therapy is the most empowering psychological intervention for women because it allows them to grow their voices, it allows them to grow their presence. And therefore, when one uh, has a say, they become, I mean, I mean all research has, has proved that when adolescent boys are not allowed to express their feelings, they become violent. Mm -hmm. So imagine nothing's been done about women. So when you allow women to express themselves, to be able, especially in the Arab world, in the Islamic world, there's been a dumbing down of women. So imagine you allow the woman to really shine. With that, she changes, right? Um, so that's why drama therapy is so amazing. Unfortunately, there's only a handful, le less than two, ha you know, less than 10 drama therapists in the Arab world. The majority are in Lebanon. That's why we're working in Lebanon and in Jordan. And we actually just signed with Uzek um, University in Lebanon to, ha to have the first drama therapists graduate from their master's program and we'll be employing them. So we're working towards having 300 drama therapists within the next 20 years to be able to work in all of the Arab world. Fantastic. Hi, everyone. Welcome back. I know, I just popped right off into the ethernet somewhere up there. But thank you for holding down the ship while I've been gone. Anna Grishting Solder, she is an amazing woman. We seem to be having amazing people on this panel today. Uh, she is an architect, urbanist, and musician. How about that for three different hats? <laughs> at border meetings from Switzerland and has graduated with a doctor of design in urbanism from Harvard University. She's lived, worked, and studied in England, Ireland, Switzerland, and the USA, and the Gulf region, and conducted research on Cyprus, Korea, Berlin, and Qatar. She is passionate about using arts and design to create a more beautiful and sustainable world through co-creative, interdisciplinary, holistic, systems based holism and systems based approaches to projects. She spent many years working on bridging borders, in particular the designing of healing ecologies in landscapes of conflict. I want to hear more about that, Anna. Her architect diploma was a project for the Berlin Wall and her PhD Doctor of Design a project and master plan for the Cyprus Green Line buffer zone. Anna's academic experiences also include teaching and researching as a fellow at the universities of Geneva, Harvard, MIT, and Vermont, where she was an instructor for the Balkans Peace Parks Academic Expedition Summer Course. At the moment, she is still the Senior Research Fellow, University of Vermont. Her research interests include public art and public realm, urban uh, agriculture in dry lands, 
food, water, energy, nexus design, urban biodiversity, urban forestry, blue urbanism, the urban legacies of mega events and healing ecologies in border landscapes of conflict. I love her motto. Listen to this. Reach for the sun and stars. Take care of Mother Earth and the oceans. Spread your life. Lo spread your love and light. Anna, welcome. Thank you so much, Linda. And thank you, uh, Stella Palau for inviting me. It's a really great honor to be here today. Um, I'm going to share my screen, if I may. Um, is, is that possible? Yes. Okay, I'll try that. And I would very much like, can you see my screen? Is it visible? Yes. Okay, so today I would like to present, uh, um, I will start with the work that I've been um, developing as a professor with my students and I call it co-creating spaces for people and the planet. So it's really talking about our mother earth and the environment. And to build on uh, what Sheikha Al Saba was saying, um, for me teaching, I was teaching mainly women in Qatar and for me it's as much teaching them content and subjects as also empowering them, um, you know, to take up their voice and also to take up challenges that need to be that need to be addressed uh, in the environment. Um, so the idea is really that we need to look at uh, cities and the environment as regenerative systems. So obviously we're changing the way that we're looking at cities, not with in input of resources and output of waste, but at really more circular systems. And my work is very much based on landscape urbanism. So it's also looking at the connection between landscape and urbanism, looking at productive landscapes, looking obviously at water management, very important in, in dry lands and even everywhere, and then also biodiversity. So this is an example of looking at these circular systems, for example, composting, how what comes out of our houses and kitchens and gardens can then become a resource um, for growing food and making soil fertile. Mm -hmm. This is a project um, by James Corner and it's also a new way of making landscapes. So it means that instead of creating a landscape from scratch, we actually work with the nature. So it's using nature systems to create more sustainable uh, and resilient landscapes. This was a report that's very important, the uh, International Panel on Climate Change and Land. So everything that we're doing as urbanists and planners uh, has a, a great effect on the climate. So, th so obviously this report for 2019 is very important. And this is also the UN report on uh, the decline of species. And I'm very much in love with um, hawksbill turtles. I'll tell you more about that later because they're found in Qatar and all the Gulf region. So the idea is also that we have to come away from this ego to a more eco-centered um, uh, approach. And there you can see where man is actually at the center of is no more longer at the top of the pyramid, but just part of the whole ecosystem. This is the UN in Geneva where I live, and you can see now that they actually have sheep grazing. They've decided to have prairies in front of the UN and sheep that graze. So this is already one of these ideas of how we're changing the way that we're creating landscapes to make them more sustainable and to work with animals. So this is a, a project, um, uh, that, an award-winning project uh, by students, which was co-creation with animals. So we can see that this is now coming uh, into, into um, the sphere of teaching and landscape and urban design. Here, I'm also talking about soil, because in fact, we really have to think about soil, um, because there's, we've been doing very unsustainable soil ma uh, management. And it's also linked to climate change. A soil has a great uh, biodiversity. And it's also very linked. A lot of research has shown the link between the gut uh, system, the microbiome of the gut and the microbiome of the soil. A healthy soil ecosystem and a healthy gut ecosystem is a resilient system. Even with this recent pandemic, we now know also that the healthy gut, the healthy immune system is much better at fighting pandemic. pandemic sorry, pandemics. So if we want to fight pandemics, we really have to look at the whole system and look at the soil as well as the gut biome. So I'll quickly go through some of these projects, Food, Water, Energy, Nexus. Um, I, I organized this in 2015 at Qatar University with the Swiss Embassy. And the idea was really looking at landscape as infrastructure for biodiversity and food security. 
Um, we were looking at perspectives also from Switzerland, Qatar. Here I brought actually a composting drum because the university has no composting. So we're wasting huge resources without composting. So we have the president of our university, the Swiss ambassador, and I'm explaining why it's important uh, to have composting. And we did a workshop. I brought a specialist to the university and I started to use the university as a living laboratory. And also this is a project that was um, funded just before I left Qatar, uh, an international research project. So the idea is really looking at the campus as, as uh, a living laboratory for the food, water, energy nexus. So redesigning the master plan to be more regenerative and obviously having the quantitative qualitative data of, of this research and looking at different pilot projects. So we're also talking obviously about stakeholders. Uh, it's really important to have all the different stakeholders on board, the government for the policy and the support, the academics for the research, the NGOs, Friends of the Environment, who I worked with for many years in Qatar with my students and also the local farmers who I was working with. And then on the campus, we have all the, the, the stakeholders, including the migrant workers who, who are very important because there's many, many of them, a lot of them are Nepali workers who come from farming communities and therefore have a lot of know-how on actually how we could uh, start to make the campus more um, uh, productive. So we paired up also with a farm uh, in Qatar, Toba Farms, and this is run by a very young, brilliant um, uh, Qatari young man who's uh, a natural healer, a doctor, but he's also building his farm in, with permaculture. So he's bringing in back the indigenous knowledge, uh, you know, of our grandfathers um, from the local knowledge, but also bringing in new knowledge from, from other places. And so we decided to work with him. And as you could see, it's about the same scale as the farm. So we're really trying to bring this knowledge on to the farm. This is a model of the university. So we had um, some design charrettes with the university, the engineers, some specialists in permaculture, some architects from architectural office, my, my research assistants. And we started to redesign the landscape, as you can see with biochar, composting, a food forest, biodiversity wadi, these edible boulevards, an urban water machine. And obviously this is all arranged in different layers. With our students, we also designed the, the old wadi into a new hotspot area. And one important thing we came up with was this idea of the food forest. So the idea of having a forest which is productive and also you need in permaculture, you need the shade to be able to grow the food. So we're actually on the university campus here with the permaculture specialist and looking, for example, this is a before and after. So if you use um, these permaculture principles well, you can have very little water and make very fertile environments. Um, this was the composting workshop. Uh, this lady is from Chicago, a specialist. So she came to Qatar and we built a composting heap with the gardeners, with our students, with architects. Um, and then we also did some plantings. Um, here you can see the Nepali workers and also the Filipino maids, my students, some architects. And here we started to build a permaculture garden in the College of uh, Engineering. This is one of the gardeners of the university. And this is the head of the uh, landscaping, one of the Nepali workers. Then we did a design with our students students for an edible garden, um, the one that you, you saw, and we did um, soil analysis, climate analysis uh, in the laboratory with the Environmental Science Center, and also with a specialist in, you know, what in, in growing food and plants locally. So we also did a case study. This is um, a permaculture specialist who in her house in Qatar, uh, was growing all this food. These are two bathtubs with, uh, with salads that she's growing with the water coming directly from her washing machine. And she also had bananas, um, and mangoes, etc. So we saw with our students, we did the case studies to see that this could really be done. So blue urban design. When I went to Qatar, I said, well, we talk about green, but there's so little water that I think we should talk about also the blue. And the blue was also a concept by Sachi and Sachi, which was not just about uh, working with water, but it was going beyond the green, which means we mustn't have just passive systems, but we must give back more to the environment than we take because we're really at a critical point. So the blue design was also this idea of giving back more than we're taking. And I published this uh, recently in Springer, so I'm happy to share that with you. Um, this was uh, published with the work that we did with my students. And I also had an, uh, published a book and had a big international conference looking at new directions in sustainable urbanism. And this was also looking at the social sciences, not just, not just the hard sciences, technology, but how do we bring the social sciences and talk also about people and communities. 
And then also biodiversity. This was very important. I was talking about biodiversity also with my students. One of my students did her um, master's thesis on a wetland that we were trying to save. This is with an architect. We're doing a, a design charrette. We, I created with the students, uh, Friends of Abu Nakla. So I was inciting them also in a bottoms up approach. This was based on the High Line in New York, which is a bottoms up approach to making a landscape. And so it was empowering them to say, you know, what needs to be done? And, you know, let's create um, an association. And we had, you know, we, we tried to communicate why there was such a rich diversity in this place. This was actually a wastewater pond, which gradually became a hotspot of biodiversity. You can see the location here in Qatar within the new green belt of Qatar. So that we designed this with the students as a new sort of eco hub with also growing food, um, biodiversity hotspot for the birds, etc. And we managed to bring it to the president of the public works with the students. So the students were able to present the project. And this is thanks to Dr. Saif al Hajri, who is the founder of the environmental NGO. So it was very important to work with him. And finally, we even presented it to the Minister of Municipality and Urban Planning. Um, unfortunately, then they decided to commission this, but it was important for the students to be able to have this process and to believe that they can have ideas and then bring them um, you know, bring them to the authorities. Um, here we were also visiting the food, um, the food production areas in Qatar. This is a redesign for the Doha Corniche, and we're looking also at the sea level rise, looking at more permeable systems, looking at a softer edge uh, where we, we create more biodiversity and also looking at saline water and salt water as a resource. So we, we're looking at saline agriculture, um, floating farms. So all of these new ideas of looking at the food production. And you can see that every time we're also looking at water, energy, waste and food um, in this redesign and looking at saline agriculture. There's actually a center for saline agriculture in the UAE where they're doing research on crops and saline agriculture. So instead of using all the energy to desalinate the water, we use uh, the salt water. So public art is also very important. This was just an image during the COVID where you know, people were exhibiting uh, art on the balconies, but with our students, um, here we come to the turtles. One of the projects I got involved with because I, I volunteered with turtles and I really fell in love with these Hawksbill turtles who are highly endangered. Um, uh, with, with our students. And so we, we promoted this idea. This is a calligraphy designed by one of my students. We promoted it as a flagship species of Qatar as the only way that we could really save it. We had a lot of public art in Qatar. This is Richard Serra in the desert and um, Sheikh Al Mayasa has brought a lot of different uh, artists there. So the students were studying public art and we did events as well and used, um, these are the leaflets, but we used a sort of uh, a performance and public art to make um, an installation in the university, um, you know, to, to raise awareness. So they also created all this awareness. And we also did one with the children in downtown, in the center of town where they had the national day celebration. So communicating this as a national flagship species. Um, and we also had the master students redesigning a eco beach for the turtle conservation. So we actually did uh, also a project for the beach, working with the Environmental Science Center and always looking with sustainable systems. Another project was urban forestry. Um, this is very important also for climate and uh, for having a good, good system in the city and the food forests, as I mentioned uh, before. And we were looking also using the wastewater because we have a lot of wastewater as there's a lot of desalination, you know, to create the, the fresh water. So the idea was looking at the different systems of wastewater to in, implement the uh, urban forestry. So this is one project you can see here for the, the new green belt of Qatar. Um, which is using this, this treated wastewater to create these new landscapes as a sort of green belt around the city. Um, this is another example in the West Bay in Qatar. So also looking at using water, uh, res the water that's used from buildings and recycled and, and uh, urban forestry. And this is also using transit oriented design. So it's with the new metro stations and new metro stops. So how do you create the landscape, the shaded landscape, the water, and with the transit oriented design. Some other projects looked at the whole of Qatar and we were looking at the mangroves and mangrove belts. So these are very important for the sea level rising as breakwaters and also for uh, the carbon capture. So this student was looking at, you know, different areas to develop or regenerate um, the mangroves. So border landscapes, 
This was interesting to see in Europe how all of a sudden after the Berlin Wall fell in, in, in 1990, 1989, we all of a sudden closed our borders recently because of, um, of the coronavirus and how cities were being closed off. I started my work in uh, 1989 in, in Berlin and Berlin was confined and this is Herbert Sukop. He was a specialist um, and, and actually sort of invented urban ecology because he was confined. He could only look at the ecology and the plants that were in Berlin. And so in a way, it's always looking at this opportunity um, and urban ecology has become very important today. So this is my project for the Berlin Wall. This was a, a water canal, a sort of memory and a scar. Um, and this is today some of the projects. This is a strip that was kept in uh, Berlin as a park. This is a bottoms up project by the people. And this is another project, um, a large project to really save the whole Iron Curtain as a green belt and to keep the patrol path as a cycling path so that you can actually cycle all across Europe on the patrol path. So this is really an environmental project. It was the biggest study of um, uh, um, habitats in Germany because they studied the whole Iron Curtain Greenbelt and it's also about memory because we're creating the memory scapes for all the victims of um, of these conflicts. This was my work for my PhD working on Cyprus so I started to look at the Cyprus buffer zone and how we could transform this buffer zone into a sort of ecological landscapes. With my students we also were looking at food water energy and waste in the Greenbelt so I'm not going to go into the details of this but um, it's looking at the green belt and this is a, these are the old quarries. So we're transforming the old disused quarries into, into landscapes and the old copper mines. Also looking at different forms of energy, solar biomass, et cetera, uh, energy infrastructures and uh, looking at food infrastructures. Um, and I also worked on Korea. This is a Korean demilitarized zone. I've been there many times. Um, you can see the similarities between these two buffer zones. Also the Great Wall of China. Here it's more looking at what is the memory of, this, um, uh, of these big walls and, uh, that you know, all gradually will fall. And we, we know one day, it might not be when we're living, but one day the, the, all the walls will fall. And the idea is how do we go from this deep wound to a beautiful scar using ecological planning? This is one of the books that I edited as well on this subject. So social ecology, it's really looking at people and ecologies. And these are some of the workshops that I did with scientists and artists from Cyprus, specialists from the University of Vermont, Professor Kim from Seoul. So really this interdisciplinary approach to creating these landscapes of, of peace. Um, so last, uh, I want to just discuss, uh, to present the project that we also developed with our students. We presented this at the Gulf Research Meeting in Cambridge last year, and it was a project that we developed with our students for, um, uh, uh, it's a, a transboundary um, protected area between Qatar and Bahrain. So here you can just see the map of the region and all these um, this oil and gas pipelines. You can also see the future railway. This is a project. You can't see the whole because there's actually all the connections with Qatar, the UAE. There's another map which I don't have. But the idea was really to connect all of the countries together with the rail system, which I hope one day will will. Um, be developed. So there was actually a conflict between Bahrain and Qatar before they uh, finalized the borders. This was many years ago. Um, I studied all of this. Um, and um, finally, the, the Hawa Islands, which you can see here, were awarded to Bahrain. And it was a long conflict and actually went to the International, uh, the, the court, uh, the international court of Justice. Um, so finally, the, the, the uh, borders were drawn and it was very important to draw the borders because, of course, if you want to exploit all the natural resources, uh, you have to have defined borders. So um, the Hawa Islands is very close to Qatar. From Qatar, you can actually walk there. So here you can see the map that was made officially with the red line that was drawn. Um, to draw the boundary between Bahrain and Qatar. So what's interesting is that the Hawa Islands are um, a Ramsar site in the process of becoming a Ramsar site. And on the Qatari side, uh, you can see that this is a biosphere reserve, Al Reem biosphere reserve, just beside the Hawa Islands. Also, after the conflict ended, there was a project, you can see this uh, line um, going across here, a project for a bridge called the Friendship Bridge, which was also going to be linking um, with the new train, the train system. So we would be in half an hour, you could be from uh, maybe a bit more longer from Doha to, 
um, to Bahrain. Um, so a lot of people were saying, well, this would be bad for the environment. And with our students, we try to think of it and design it. it, it it's not very easy to understand this map, but it's actually um, also, it's actually mapping a lot of different habitats and types of soils and, and et cetera. So we decided to say, well, what if we built this bridge to be like an ecological infrastructure? And there's a lot of problems of current here. There's not enough water. So we could actually create it uh, as something that could create energy, but at the long, at the same time, become a gateway for a new protected area. So the bridge would be the gateway for this new protected air, transboundary protected area between Bahrain and Qatar. So this was the, the, the bridge that was proposed um, that would link Qatar and also with the new high speed rail. So these were just some of the um, different scenarios, but the idea was really this transboundary um, protected area. And uh, what we have here is we have the, the, the dugongs, we have the, um, the hawksbill turtles, we also have dolphins, we have whale sharks, etc. So, um, it, you know, it is really a very uh, a hot spot of biodiversity. So the idea that, as you can see here, the dugong marine reserve um, is, is planned here. So, so the idea is how do we envision this as a transboundary area? Because if you want to protect the environment, um, you know, you have to work across borders. So, um, sorry. So we know that today there's there's been a sort of a border dispute now also with Qatar. And um, so I said to my students, it was even more important to continue these, these projects because in fact, when we have political disputes, um, scientists, NGOs, and people working on the environment or artists continue to work across the border. So it's important to keep developing these ideas and, and to work on them. So I'm going to just finish up very quickly with a project that I developed when I was in Boston. I, I lived in this neighborhood. So this is a very small peace park named after Frederick Douglass. And we created this with my, with my um, late husband and the community. And um, Frederick Douglass used to have his office there, but there was no sign for him, no, no remembrance, no, no memorial space. And the young kids here did not even know who Frederick Douglass was. So we created this peace park with young students who created a memorial for Frederick Douglass. These were architecture students. And we created a stage, we created a garden. And then this developed also, I, I started looking at another network of public spaces because the city was not investing in these areas, in these parts of the city. And it went on also to develop into urban farming. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to go into this because I don't have much time, but I also want to, you know, we talk a lot about smart cities and I think we also have to talk about smart citizens about, you know, and I think the work of Sheikh Al Sabah is also about, you know, having people who are um, not just smart, but who really, you know, have a good, um, you know, this positive psychology, who feel good and who, who are able to be good actors in society. Um, and also agile for fragile. We also have to be more agile in our systems, also for more fragile communities, because we've seen during COVID a lot of fragile people. And this is just the last slide um, that, you know, there is no planet B. Um, there might be a plan B, but there's no planet B. Um, so, you know, it's very important that, that we always think of the planet in everything that uh, we do. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much. Thank you very, very much. I appreciate all of your information. I'm, I'm left with one thought. I want you to rule the world. I want you to be in charge of the entire planet. Then I think we'll be in good shape. What amazing work you have done. Thank you so, so much. Queen Diambi, Kabatutsulia, close, of the Bakwaluntu people of Central Kasai in the Dem De Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, Queen Diambi holds a doctorate of public administration. Uh, she also has a doctorate honoris causa of philosophy and humanities, professorship in international law and order, master of science in applied psychology, master of science in mental health counseling, also holds a bachelor of science in business finance and economics. She is the founder of the Elikia Hope Foundation, NYC, I imagine that's New York City, and she is the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the State of the African Diaspora, Diaspora of the Sixth Region of Africa, which is recognized by the African Union. Queen Diambi has always been very interested in all matters concerning the restoration of African identity through the study of African history and of the cultural heritage of the continent. And we will now play her clip. Hello, everyone. I'm Queen Diambi Kabatuswila Chiyomwata 
I'm uh, the queen of the Bakwaluntu people of Kasai, I'm Mukalenga Mukajiwan Kashama, which means the female king of the order of the leopard. And I'm also queen mother of the African descendants of Brazil. And I'm very happy to be here to share this wonderful panel with absolutely amazing people and good activists about the environment. And we're gonna have a conversation today about the environment. So as you can see today, I'm in nature, as you can see in the back, there is the water, there is the trees, there is the grass, there is the sky, there is all of this animals and fishes in the fish in the water and uh, all of this to just remind us that all of this was here on this planet before we got here and there is a reason why the creator decided to put all of these elements before we got here because the creator um, this knew that we needed all of this in order for us to survive, in order for us to thrive. And in all the uh, myth of uh, creation or in the, you know, the sacred text of every single, you know, religion, when we talk about the creation of man, oftentimes it has to do with nature. They talk about taking the dirt or the clay and making the human being from nature. So which reveal, you know, metaphorically that we are nature. We are also part of this nature we are of the nature we're not ex external to nature and we're not just like if we were parachuted from somewhere here on the planet earth we are really from the planet earth we are the children of the planet earth just like the trees just like the water just like everything that we see around us so it's very important to make that point because we are uh, if you can look at me you can see that I'm queen from, you know, an ancient, you know, people, the Luntu people who are also uh, part of the Luba group in Congo and not only in Congo, but it's also Southern Africa. And uh, my adornments and my, you know, uh, regalia is all made out of natural material, natural fibers and carry shells and feathers and, you know, 100% uh, cotton. And inside, if you could look at my crown inside, it's all, you know, raffia, it's all natural material. And, you know, we, we wear all that on us because we use nature to adorn ourselves because it's a, it's a, it's a pact that we have made with, you know, with how we respect nature. So nature is not just there to serve us as to provide us with food, provide us with oxygen, provide us with water, provide us with shelter, provide us with clothing or adornment, but it also provides us with um, some inspiration. When you look around me and you go to any places in the world where you see mountains with snow or you see a beautiful desert dunes or you see a volcano or you see you just look at the ocean or a beautiful river even a spring you can realize that nature is abundant and nature just want one thing to give and has provision for all our needs. This has been going on for thousands and thousands of years. I believe if we take a note of the um, information we have in the scientific community, we can admit that we've been around for uh, over 200,000 years as Homo sapiens sapiens. So, and we lived 130,000 years in Africa alone. And we know, for all of you who know a little bit about Africa, or have seen some of, of, of our Africa, the nature is extremely abundant. And you can live just off of nature without even, you know, having hard, hard work to do to collect, you know, the fruits and, and, and get the fish and, and get, you know, the, the game meat and so forth. So nature is very abundant, very, uh, first, especially from the Congo because I come from where there is the tropical forest. So all these elements just give us an assurance that when we were created, everything was provided for us. But nature also forged us. Nature forged how we look. So the more the sun, the darkest, you know, the features that we have, all of that is part of what nature does. Nature works with us to shape us so we can be best fitted to live in the environment where we are. And it can take 10,000 years, it can take 20,000 years or 30,000 years, but nevertheless, the contract we have had with nature for all these hundreds of thousands of years was very much balanced because so far we lived all these thousands of years in symbiosis with nature. We were able to build amazing civilization like the civilization of Kemet, which is sometimes called Egypt, where we can see that these civilizations sustained for thousands of years, like maybe four, five, six, eight thousands of years, and are still some of the remnants of these civilizations still remain. And you know, the driving element when you look at these civilizations is that a lot of them 
worked the contract with nature very well. They knew what nature was there to bring them and they respected nature. They respected the cycle of nature. They respected the lesson of nature because they learned from nature everything that they needed to know to know how to live on this planet and to adapt and adopt certain elements from the planet for our food, for our healing because the, the plants, you know, we have healing plants and we have of course food and we can sustain ourselves. And like I said earlier, we have shelter and clothing and adornment. So we have lived like that for thousands and thousands and thousands of years and we were able to develop many magnificent you know cultures all throughout the planet so this is a common threat you know and a common threat now when we know that the nature is not okay anymore when we know that we have gone astray from a path of wisdom where now our system of um, economic system has now taken a, a, a another type of attitude towards nature nature now nature is no longer a, a a friend or a partner now nature is a place where we can just go and take and exploit and and just uh, pillage and then just so that we can edify ourselves with having a uh, lots of wealth or material stuff or you know you know comfort and so forth but we've always had you know material things and comfort but it's the contract we had now the contract is almost like it's an open space where there is no more uh, limit and no more regimentation of how much we take and how much we plunder and how much you know when is it enough there is no cap to you know enough there is no cap we have to keep on going and going and going and we we pump you know oil from the seas and we we cut trees from the forests and we cut we, we so it's like there is no tomorrow there's no stopping so we we have a system now a, a, a economic system that is contained in its design uh, the illusion that nature is perpetual and nature is almost um, untarnishable that nature kind of like replenish itself automatically and there is nothing that we need to do to make sure that that happens so because we have a system where it's, uh, we, 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 we're looking to always have more 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 profit more profit more profit more accumulation of things more accumulation of things more accumulation of things all that has to be you know uh, that has to come from somewhere and you know nobody's inventing something from thin air unless it's you know um, you know intellectual or artistic creation or intellectual property most of the things that you know are running this economy it's really production of material you know goods but there is to have an understanding now that we have gone too far when I first heard about climate issues I was you know maybe in my 20s or so and we were talking about the ozone layer and we were talking about how we basically blew a hole in the ozone layer and it's like how can it be possible for so long millions of years of this planet existing we are now the generation who were able or that were able to blow up a hole in the ozone layer so this cannot be replenished so we look at nature as if it can, it can be it's perpetual but nature is not perpetual we have to start understanding and including in our economic model the fact that nature is scarce and nature has a rhythm to it to replenish itself and yes the damage that we're causing to nature can be permanent and can also cripple you know our ability to live sanely and health healthy on this planet and whatever we do here in any parts of the world affect the entire world because the planet is round is a round bubble of water so if i pour some you know detergent right here well guess what on the other side of the lake there will be it will be affected depending on the amount of detergent i pour so the planet is an entire body of water before being anything else it's just water that communicate with each other so anything that we do in one part of the world affect the entire part and the entire planet so even though we don't we live in areas where we don't see the immediate damage I know that there are countries that are really seeing the effect and that are very concerned like my friends in Bahrain are very concerned about the rise of the water because of the climate change and the temperature rising so we have to start thinking uh, when we think about the environment in a global way as well. We cannot just have local solution and think that it's going to work. We have to fundamentally, uh, you know, address two particular areas. The personal area where individuals have to take their own courage and their own responsibility towards nature and realize that everything we do, every behavior we have, everything we buy has a 
a, a carbon print to it, a cost to nature attached to it. And we have to be able to evaluate what is the cost that we are willing to pay for what kind of comfort. And, and so we have to adopt certain behaviors that will be, you know, that will ease, you know, the damage that we cause or even stop the damage that we cause because of certain behaviors that we can put, put aside. The second thing is on the institutional level, you know, the political structures, the governance structures, we, the individuals, have to put pressure on these institutions so that they can start really taking very seriously, they can adopt very serious you know policies but also have the means to implement them because it's one thing to have a policy but the next thing to implement them and we have to recruit everybody and put everybody on board this is where you can no longer have division between you know uh, people from the north people from the south people who are white people who are brown people who are, who are black people who are women people who are men people who are young or old this is a concern for all of us so this is a good time for us to start understanding that we are global citizens and that's why I call you my global family and that we are responsible for this planet and uh, this planet has been there long before we appeared and I believe it will be there long after we disappear and we can be there for a long time like some of our you know counterpart you know humanoid that been roaming on the planet but for some reason XYZ reason one day they vanished you know we don't always have an explanation for it but why the, din the dinosaur vanished those are a counterpart you of um, living being okay some species disappear every single day for a reason that sometimes we cannot comprehend some of it has to do with our activity but some of them has to do with you know the matrix of nature so we don't know how long we have we don't know if we are here for eternity but we know we can prolong our stay and we can definitely uh, use our intelligence yes but also heart with wisdom imbued with a lot of wisdom a lot of love to say to ourselves we can do this together. We have a big responsibility. We have to take care of our Mother Earth. We, we can do something. And I always, you know, see people bragging about being intelligent because we have all this technology now and we are building this and we are defying, you know, gravity. We are flying up in the sky and we're going into the space. Yeah, this is just a tiny bit of, you know, expressions of intelligence. But that doesn't show that we are intelligent. And smart. What will show that we are smart is when we see that, that we're bringing humanity to a cliff where we can we are we have become our, our way of life and our activity has become a threat to life itself. The wise and the smart move to do is to stop and to take time to think and to take time to realize that we have an obligation to collaborate together and to hear each other out and to see each other as part of the same human family so that we can tackle these problems together. We can no longer turn our faces and say whatever happened over there doesn't concern me. We can no longer do that. We cannot afford to do that anymore. So I'm here with my family talking about the environment to let you know that I am also with you in this fight. And, and I harbor my ancient tradition that I inherited from hundreds of years of my people. And in this wisdom, there is definitely the concept of sacred ecology, so that everything in the creation of God is sacred. That God is not some kind of entity that is out there and then is, you know, detached from the affairs that are happening here. God has imbued himself or herself, whichever your fate is, into every piece and every aspect of creation. This is what I got from my forefathers and my great, 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 great grandparents and my ancestors. They know that nothing is alive, nothing exists without the precious and the sacred breath of the divine of the creator. So if we start understanding that yes, it's okay, we go and pray in our churches, we go in our mosque, we go in our temple, we go in nature to pray, that's fine. You know, but prayer is not just limited to uttering beautiful, you know, commitments to the Creator. Prayer is also how we act towards God's creation. So 
a prayer, when you preserving nature, when you making sure that you know the animals have a safe place to develop themselves, when you making sure that you're not polluting the water or the air with breathe, it's one of the most beautiful prayer that you can do. So I, with this, you know, comment, for me, praying is that. Praying is about reverence to every single life, including the grass on which I step right now, including the waters that you see behind me, because all of this would not happen without the ultimate, you know, and primordial, you know, ancestor, which is, you know, the creator himself or herself. So I really give you my love and my gratitude for giving me this space to express myself and I want to join you in whatever venture that you are on, in whatever fight that you are on to make sure that we do something to change the way we live on this planet because our children deserve it, our children are demanding it and they do deserve it. So please, please, please join me and I will join you so hey, the global family is going to mobilize for the climate and I love you guys, I love Bahrain. You are a family to me. I've always been so kindly received there and I love all of you guys and I really appreciate the honor and the space that you open up for me to express myself. So with all my love, Queen Diambi Kabatuswila Chiyo Mwata. Bye guys. Oh my word, she is so lovely. She is so lovely. Wow. Uh, please extend our appreciation to her, Amina, for giving us that wonderful video. Thank you. I now get to introduce Kai. There you are. Kai Mietling from Germany and currently living in Bahrain. Is that correct? Kai is an architect and project manager, waste, waste entrepreneur, and founder of Waste speaker and coach. Kai is a flexible project manager and team worker leader with social competence and fast understanding of challenges and problems, active decider with structured actions, educated and certified in Germany as a lecturer and architectural diploma with positive attitude to develop solutions for solving problems and overcoming challenges. Kai was also the representative architect design and project manager for GCC of Tilke and Par Partners, the design company for Formula One in Bahrain and in UAE. He is an active member of Social Media Club Bahrain and founding member of the Bahraini German Cultural Association, as well as of the Dubai amateur soccer team, Safa FC. Kai is disrupting the traditional architectural engineering processes and implementing waste management technologies in an early stage. Welcome, Kai. We are looking forward to hearing what you can share with us today. First of all, thank you very much for having me. It's a lovely introduction and uh, amazing ladies. Uh, we were talking before me and thanks to Amina for bringing all of us uh, together. So I'm really, really impressed by uh, the different kind of topics and I think there will be two uh, more coming. So from my perspective, uh, when she asked me uh, to talk about the environment, I feel that as an architect, uh, we are actually building surroundings for the humans. And the case is that uh, unfortunately, the humans, we are the only spaces who are creating the waste from the day actually we are born till we somehow pass away and uh, go back to Mother Earth. So the issue is that uh, we as a human, we are our whole life consistency uh, surrounding or producing the waste. But on the other hand, uh, we don't have really a kind of education on how to deal with waste and how to treat this uh, valuable resource material within a processing of any kind of uh, production of products. So the thing is, for us, we need to learn more about the environment and why it's so important on the protection and on the other hand, how to deal with the waste which we are producing on a daily basis. On this matter, uh, last year in cooperation with the uh, chain of supermarkets here in Bahrain, uh, I developed a training program on environmental awareness which actually is focusing on three compartments, which is one, to give the people a knowledge, a general knowledge on waste, on what we are dealing on a daily basis with the waste packing, the plastic packing, the aluminium, and uh, 
other kind of wrappings which we can easily let's say reduce and then obviously as well segregate in a later stage for the recycling purpose the second part would be then how to communicate the things which you can change how to provide people as well the solution because a lot of the time we have only a small step to do but the people who are willing to do something they sometimes don't know where to start and what to do and specifically how to go in the right direction so the people in general they need guidance rather than uh, instruction because they have a lot of ideas but they don't know really how to implement it and the third part of the program is literally how to change or how to put these things into place with the right wording as well uh, a lot of people they come to me oh guy we're doing recycling at home i said oh very good so you have a recycling plant at home and they said no 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 but we have a carton and boxes to segregate which is an important part of the whole uh, circular economy nevertheless the people need to use the right wording in order to really comprehend and achieve certain goals what they are setting in their mind so this is a, a part where i need to build up actually on the part of architecture because when we have architects we are a lot of time focusing on design specifically here in the region uh, we have architectural design then it goes to the building permission and afterwards the execution is up to the civil engineers and the drawings of the shop drawings are produced by the contractors who then do actually the execution and the civil engineers the site supervision rather than the architect like in germany for example being involved in the design from the beginning from the first line concept design till handing over the key and what i'm always missing even in different parts of the world that the focus is rather on the design than on the operation like for example we're building or we're designing a kitchen for 10 15 000 bd but then you have a two three bd waste bin rather than having an integrated waste uh, segregation system within the premises within the flats within the buildings and this obviously uh, what anna mentioned it goes beyond this one when it comes to urban planning a lot of urban planning there is not really the waste processing into place we know okay we're producing waste but where is the processes where is the structure to first of all reduce the waste and second of all then to have the waste properly segregated in order to reevaluate it to recycle it to compost it what she mentioned in the, in her qatar uh, university these are all aspects which need to be as well implemented in the curriculum specifically now in architecture but nevertheless as well in the curriculum of the students in the kindergarten in the schools in universities and moreover as well into different kind of companies because a lot of times as mentioned there's policies in place but the people don't know how to interact with the policies so they don't know what to do we have here as well certain campaigns our city should become greener or the country should become greener of course this is the aim but how to achieve these different kind of steps and how to achieve these different kind of goals the people need to know and need guidance as i said they have ideas into place but we need to help them to realize these kind of ideas and put them into the right direction uh, as a sample here they brought in waste bins a new waste bins but i'm not a friend of waste bins actually because the more waste bins you put outside the people will create more waste so i made a proposal for a popular beach here in bahrain which we will discuss hopefully this or next week then where there will be no bins on the beach and the people are quite surprised how like this but the thing is okay whatever we as human bring to the beach after we use we do barbecue we drink and eat and these things we can take all this stuff back so we didn't don't need to immediately dispose it on the place where we use it because the weight which we bring to the beach obviously with the full food containers and full water bottles becomes literally empty once we finish our barbecue and then we can, can take everything back so literally in public places we actually don't need any kind of waste bin which is saving at the end as well money for the government and this is also a crucial aspect uh, environment or uh, environmental friendly technologies doesn't mean mandatory you spend a hell out of money at the end if it's properly implemented in the right circular economy it will save you money 
And these are certain aspects which need to be known for the people in place who are in the responsible positions to take decisions. If these people are not really aware, then a lot of things, a lot of initiatives are actually dried out even before the seeds are, are grown. So it will take some time. And on the other hand, we need to have this public awareness rather than having only technologies, having only facilities there. Because even if facilities are in place, like different kinds of collection bins, the people sometimes don't know what to do with it. Sometimes they throw different kinds of stuff in the uh, segregation bins. In the aluminum container, you find a lot of paper or plastic or whatever. The people don't even know which kind of different plastic need to be collected. So a lot of things starts actually from the beginning with the education and the awareness. And of course, the convenience of using these kind of facilities. If I don't have a proper facilities in my area, I will not even think about how to start because I need to monitor and make sure that the full cycle is actually as well working. If there is a gap in the circular economy, then obviously what happened, it will become again a linear economy and which is actually not good for nature and for the humans. And when uh, the queen from uh, Africa was telling about the surrounding with nature, she was mentioning that nature is actually giving us all the resources which we need for living. You know, so we need actually to preserve our resources rather than destroying it on a daily basis, what we are seeing now through social media and these things. So a key aspect is really, really to take care of the nature as our own mother. And this is what I'm trying to sometimes convince people uh, to tell them, okay, you should treat Mother Earth like your own mother. You know, once you treat your Earth in a bad manner, and specifically, let's talk about the, the, the region here, you can really comprehend them and see you want the earth to breathe, you want the earth to live, you want the nature to live. Same what you want definitely for your mom. You want them to stay alive as long as possible and rather than cutting down things. And these kind of various things need really, really to be deeply implemented in the education system at the first place. And when I mean education system, I'm not talking only about the schools and these things was mentioned earlier, the young people, because the young generation, of course, they are more receptive for different kind of knowledge. But what is the point of having, let's say, 30 or 40 percent of a population smart at knowledge, knowledgeable about waste management, environment, awareness and these things and mindful. And then you have got the 50 percent of, a, let's say, the older generation who are then destroying it because they are somewhat the decision makers who are having the power to change policies, to change communities within certain rules and regulations, which is also a part of it. And everybody actually knows the kind of triangle which is for the recycling, the three green arrows. And I feel it should be, first of all, education is one part, then we need to have facilities and technologies in place, and of course, policies with incentives and punishments in order to really streamline the full circular economy. Because without this circular economy, if there's a gap, there's a leakage, and the leakage will lead obviously to destruction. And this uh, is a very mandatory that we really, really, at the first place, focusing on the education. You can have the nice, the best technology if the people don't know how to use it, then it's worthless. Because we get the request in the past to build as well a, a hospital in Congo, actually in Democratic Republic of Congo, and they want to have a VVIP hospital. We said, listen, we need to downscale it on a certain level that even you can maintain it. Because if you have a specific handle for the operation theater and it will break and nobody can fix it, the whole hospital becomes obsolete. So we need to implement technologies based on the level of society of the capability of the knowledge of society. And when we built here as a sample in 2004, the Formula One race track in Bahrain, nobody else, because Bahrain was a lead country in the region for having sports Formula One here in the Middle East, nobody know how to maintain, how to operate, and how to facilitate a Formula One race track. So our company, they took over three years the role of maintaining, operating, and at the same time, the Bahrain International Circuit they were uh, hiring Bahraini people 
So they will get trained under us. So we had a knowledge transfer, which is very important. And after a certain period of time, after the three years, what happened is they took over the whole facility and were running it by themselves. So the next step was in 2009, when we built the Formula One in Abu Dhabi and 2011 in Baku in Azerbaijan, the Emirati people, they came to Bahrain and get trained by Bahraini people. And the Bahraini people fly over to Abu Dhabi to train them. And same happened in, in Baku, where the Baku people, they came to Bahrain and they get trained then afterwards so again the in Baku by Bahraini people. So it was a possibility that to transfer the knowledge, to enhance the education, to enhance the knowledge within the region here, so they benefiting from it afterwards. And this is such an important aspect that you transfer knowledge in order to get everyone step by step involved. Nothing can be done by itself or by one alone. The biggest task is actually together we can make this kind of big difference step by step in educating and people and exchange of knowledge. Once we exchange the knowledge, we can step by step improve whatever we can get, gain from it, from different kind of cultures, different kind of countries, different kind of habits, different kind of societies, and then evolve more and more. So there is a broad base when the people directly see the environment, okay, we need to protect it because this is our base of living. And for this, I would just like to mention a, a kind of new project, what is hopefully happening the next year from our side or from my side. In 2017, we showed here the movie A Plastic Ocean. And obviously, the world is not only about the, uh, the ocean. Of course, it's mandatory because ocean is life, water is life. But specifically, we have as well a land area. And we have an area here in the Middle East, specifically, which is a desert. So we are planning to do a documentary, which is called A Plastic Desert, which should be happening then hopefully next year. I'm in touch with different kind of uh, movie entities. So hopefully this project will be moving forward and then help as well to raise the awareness on the importance of a clean environment, even within the desert area, which we have here in the region. So this is right now all from my side. I thank again for the honor to being here in this panel. And I'm hoping that we get even more and more knowledge from each other and exchange and uh, bring capacity to different kinds of countries and areas. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Kai. You bring a, a, a great perspective to this situation. Thank you for sharing that with us. I would like to introduce Heidi now. Um, Heidi Solba is from Estonia, and she's the president and head of the Global Network, which is serving today one of the fastest growing civic movements called Let's Do It World. The network of global doers, I love that, global doers, I want to be a global doer, <laughs> has, crazy, has a crazy ambition to lead in 24 hours global campaign, World Cleanup Day, with belief that everything is possible. The first task to her was to create the worldwide network with the teams, with knowledge, and, and to lead it to be a part of the World Cleanup Day. On the 15th of September, 2018, engaged 17.8 million people, is that correct? Yes. Wow. From 157 countries in just 24 hours. Mm -hmm. And on the second World Cleanup Day, on the 21st of September 2019, she engaged 21, over 21 million people from mm -hmm. 180 countries. World Cleanup Day is a unique model by engaging communities. A global movement can make a real change with all, all with one goal and one purpose to change the way we think, act, and live. The next and third World Cleanup Day, I wanna be a part of this, just letting you know right now, will take place on the 21st of September, 2020. Heidi's background of the higher, edu of, of higher degrees on environmental protection and international business management, and also practice to work with all sectors, private, public, and non-governmental, as human resource director, CSR director, trainee, and consultant, have been raising and giving needed background to work for the purpose of the let's doers. <laughs> so please, Heidi, welcome, and please share with us what you think we would need to know right now. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for inviting and it's really, really fantastic uh, session. 
So yes, uh, Let's Do It Well currently is operating in 150 countries and our third World Cleanup Day will be 19th of September, which is each third Saturday, each third Saturday of September. Um, and uh, yes, I, when I, I'm looking back, when we started this movement for the World Cleanup Day, which is our this kind of main project, what we are doing, then um, the findings of leaders in the world during two years, even three years, was really, really exciting. And to build up those teams too. So, um, and uh, one of the kind of high moments for me was uh, when I had a call from Syria, which was in civic war by this time. And uh, I had a call from Racha Shamon, one of our leaders now. Um, and uh, and she was saying that they want to be part of this, uh, this movement. And I was really surprised because this country is in war and how it become that actually they can be a part of this, of this movement. And she said something really interesting. She said that not all the parts, of course, of their country are the, in the war, but, uh, but we, want to, we want to forget that they are in the war and we want to do something really good to our communities. And we have, want to feel something really positive, which is engaging us. And this, I think, is really powerful word. So we might be saying that movements who are combining people and are doing such uh, positive actions like cleanups or whatever positive actions what we are doing are actually bringing people, um, I think, better, being better persons or be better humans and, uh, and, and we might be saying this kind of moments might be also working for the peace. So I, I think for me, it was really strong uh, lesson. And to work with uh, teams around the globe is really, really, really interesting. Uh, and really like a humble work to serve the nature. Um, now we coming to the work cleanup day, we might be thinking, okay, we had a COVID-19 and how we actually can do the work cleanup day in this year. We have different kind of formats and one of them is individual cleanup. So you can go individually and still serve the world and do the cleanup. Or if it's some countries where there is no so much big uh, uh, restrictions, we, we still can do a group cleanup. For example, in Estonia, we can do or we might be having also a digital cleanup, which is also one of the formats which a lot of organizations or business sector is using. <clears throat> um, I, I do see that actually this movement is growing. And it's not a question about the movement. I think different kinds of movements in the world are growing because all the people can see that it's a need of the nature, it's a need of the, of, of the world itself. And we have to do something in, in, about it together. So uh, we, we do have quite a big organizations or corporates who want to be part of the solution. Uh, also, a lot of governments have been taking part of the Let's Do It of the World Cleanup Day. And I think, um, I think the most important about the World Cleanup Day is not the cleaning itself as such, because I think, of course, the world will be a cleaner place, but it will be not a clean place. Um, but I think the most important is that it's providing are humans and people who are coming together and understanding that actually we can act together. We can act together and it's not matter where we are, what is our, our nationality, what is our background. We're coming together, we simply are solving, solving uh, this uh, problem of the waste, which is littering around us. And my personal experience from 2008, when I was first time part of the Estonia First, work, uh, first Cleanup, I was absolutely changed as a human after that, and I was not part of this global movement yet. It happened, I think, nine years later. But I know from my mm, personal experience that people, when they will go to the action, it comes through your body, and you start to be in contact with other people from yourself, with yourself, and also with the world, and also the earth. And it will change you as a person. And I think this is a really powerful thought and experience. What we're expecting for the work cleanup day is actually that it brings people together and also different kinds of stakeholders. And from that point, start things happen. Because if we can solve together a work cleanup day, we can also solve different kinds of other projects or problems what we might be arising. The biggest asset of this movement is a network. So we can sort of use this network for really good pur purpose. And um, I really like to say something more. 
in the moment when people actually will realize that we are not um, playing an organization or so movements, we are not serving our personal egos or titles or, or bank, bank accounts. We are working simply for one aim. In this moment, actually, a lot of problems in the world might be solved. And what I'm expecting from the world is not just working with different countries in, in one organization, but also I, I really, my biggest desire is to see that a lot of NGOs are working together at, and, and, and seeing the same um, cause and the same aim why we are working together and what is our mutual, this kind of purpose, why we started to act on, 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 on the earth. So um, I think when we are working together by empowering each other um, and uh, seeking uh, this kind of mutual collaboration and also impact in the world, then uh, I think the things might be happening in really, really positive direction. Um, in Let's Do It World, we are talking about magical 5% of engagement uh, to the work cleanup day. Of course, we are not, we are quite far from this number, but why we talk about this number is that by, by, by the scientists, we know that, uh, well, from the scientist uh, service, we know that this 5% is a percentage when uh, something will be changing in the world. It's a critical mass of the people's what we need in order to, to bring them on to cleanups in order to raise awareness to uh, to diminish the, their their uh, trust blindness what people usually do have so people are used to work on labor already inside the trash on the waste and uh, i'm absolutely agree with sky um the first thing is awareness but the se second thing is actually education and this is exactly what our network is doing also educating uh, schools uh, i think this kind of environmental literacy is really really important also, uh, I think this is also not enough. It's really important to engage different stakeholders to work together because if you talk about the waste, how we are producing first the waste, how we are living inside the waste, who are like consuming the waste we are, and how we are managing the waste. We have to look at all this, all this chain and um, simply also in really, really positive way to influence all the producers or, or the productions uh, and try to seek a new solutions on, and definitely work on the circular economy, as Christ said as well, and, uh, and try to, um, to work in really positive way and help each other and support each other. So, um, and I really like to say that we have to come from ego era and start to work in eco era, which means working together and, 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 and trying to find solutions is the most important if you talk about how we can actually solve the environmental issues in our world. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, Heidi. Uh, I very much appreciate your perspective. You are doing amazing work and making a huge huge difference on this planet. Uh, your movement will only grow further as time goes on with your commitment and your passion. I have no doubt whatsoever. <laughs> Namshid Nazir from Bahrain. Welcome. I am so glad you are here today. He has, uh, he's, first of all, he's the recycling and social entrepreneur and the founder of the Ebin Company. He is active in so many areas. But please, Namshid, will you tell us about what all you are doing right now? Because I think you can say it far better than I can. Welcome. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. I have learned a lot from you all. And um, I'm not doing much. I'm just, uh, we just, uh, uh, you know, uh, recycling is kind of, um, uh, there, there are so many misconceptions about recycling, like even Kai said. You know, uh, some terminologies are all mixed up. And I, 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 let me introduce first myself that from 19 years old, I've been into this industry, recycling industry, uh, which is a scrap metal yard or which is called as material recovery facility where all the 
metal recyclables come and then we process it in different ways so that uh, it goes to its own recycling factories. So I've been, doing, I've been in this industry for so long and uh, once I saw in my own home that, uh, I, that, you know, I wasn't connected with metals and anything waste metals, it's, it's a direct uh, link to me. So I've, I've seen my wife throwing, you know, the, uh, you know, the tin cans and the aluminum cans and the waste. And I was like, oh, why, why do we have to throw that? Let's, you know, I, I kept, a, I, my internet is unstable. Yeah, so I, I have kept, uh, two bags always. Uh, I said, you know what, any metals you get out of the waste, please throw in these bags. And then I collected, collected almost for a year. I can see that at least two or three kilos per month, I could save it. I mean, and then why to throw that somewhere where this could be used and reused and, you know, it could be melted and uh, gone to as a uh, great product. So then uh, I had a plan. Let's, you know what, let's, uh, it's, it's easy nowadays with social media because uh, like everyone mentioned here, you know, awareness is key. Uh, if you don't, uh, uh, you know, uh, work more on awareness, things won't work. And we need a lot of people doing that together, N not necessarily perfectly, but imperfectly also, but at least everyone are doing it. And then uh, we, we started and I, I started calling it as uh, not recyclables. I've been three months and four months. I was trying to get homes and, uh, mo uh, you know, the moms who actually manage homes, uh, I was trying to connect so many homes and offices. I couldn't three, four months. I couldn't, you know why? Because I didn't know these things are called as recyclables. Actually, it is not. It is called as crap. I mean, why recyclables never got into the recycling system because the word itself was wrong. Then I understood there were so many misconceptions regarding recycling because when people say recycling, People think plastics, ah, plastic water bottle. Yeah, let me recycle. No, the, 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 I, I should say that 80% in the weight or 70% in the weight, it's metals which get recycled. So the olden times where our grandfathers and grandmothers have been using the copper, uh, copper utensils and the brass uh, items, these were the golden times for re metals recycling. Right now, the value has diminished for all our waste or recyclables, whatever we collect from homes and uh, offices. So it was very hard uh, for us to engage in collection. So what we do is basically we, uh, we have set uh, some collection methods. On Saturdays, we collect from homes. We, uh, over the week, uh, we gather all the collection requests from homes and we collect on Saturday we uh, assign all the uh, collection in such a way that we don't lose much uh, fuel or effort so that, you know, uh, things could make sense. And from Tuesdays, we do for organ organizations. So uh, uh, coming back to the misconceptions and then coming back to the actions, I mean, if uh, what my thing was that every one of us should recycle. Everyone of us should segregate our waste. What we mean by recycle is segregate our waste. Now, when we say segregate our waste, the most common thing we would say what? Plastics. And then we would say what? Metals. And then we would say paper, right? These three, right? No, it's more than that. It's more than that. Because if you just said that, that, that means automatically you said the paper cups are recyclable? No. The paper lid, the paper cup lids are recyclable? No. All the papers are recyclable? No. Even, you know, uh, I love the cleanups. Uh, even the cleanups call us and say, you know what, you take the recyclables out. There, there are hardly any recyclables because mostly are everything are the uh, for uh, single use plastics, which is worthless because when you buy a water bottle uh, in Bahraini terms, it's how many fills? 100 fills? So what do you think of the diminishing, the packaging value? 20 fills, five fills. So how can a collection be feasible? So if collection is not feasible, then recycling is not feasible. So uh, now, uh, you know, the importance once, why I will say why we need every home, every single human being is uh, starting to segregate their waste and recycle right not just recycle metals, paper, and plastics, and just dump 
all contaminated waste together. That's not it. We need to segregate into more. Like if you if you are all are in are in Instagram or Facebook, just follow hashtag recycle right. Hashtag recycle right. So in this, you could see that segregation is more deeper than the normal segregations which you see. We need to go more deeper and we need to really understand our waste. It just takes three months. When you do more and more and more, it just takes three months, you will be master of your own waste. You would be knowing your waste more personally and uh, you would be recycling it right. And then you know what happens? When you go to shop, when you go to shop, 80% or 90% of the time, you don't want to buy a packaging that was not actually recyclable, though it has a logo. It's re the beautiful recyclable logo. You know, uh, that's the funny part. So there are so much mis misconceptions. How we could start, we need to start by recycling it right and giving it to the, I, I don't know if uh, all the attendees are from Bahrain. So if you're in Bahrain, you can just uh, give a follow at Eben Company and if you, you can ask for recycling list and you can learn as you go. You don't have to be perfectionist to start with us. You can just start and out, once you see our drivers will be actually rejecting some, then you know that these are not recyclables and we would be, because we would be only taking only recyclables. And uh, since one year, we have had almost 500 to 700 people who is recycling with us. And we did about a 30 tons, 30 tons, which could have uh, filled in landfills. And people also became more conscious uh, on not to buy, which generates waste, but to buy something that's, that goes in the circular economy. And that's how recycling could help. And yeah, that's it. That's what I, I wanted to say. Wow. Thank you, Namshi. Thank you so much for that information. I totally had no clue about that. I do now, and I will certainly uh, uh, hashtag recycle right. Yeah. And then uh, at the eBin company, we ask for a recycle list. Is that yeah. correct? And that's yeah, you could, uh, yeah. And did you put that um, that company website in the chat box? Would you be kind I, enough? I, I will. That? I will do that right now. Yes, please do. I want to make certain that I uh, go there, take a look at that, share it. Like you said, social media is our friend. Yeah. <laughs> and it's yeah. going to be what helps it us. It reach to millions, which is, which is amazing nowadays. We don't have any, we don't have any uh, excuses not to uh, do great things. That is so true. Well, I am going to, uh, again, oh my gosh, thank you all so much. Um, for enlightening us, for giving us information that is critical and vital for us to know. Uh, thank you again, Amina, for making this possible, for bringing together people like this who have something important to share with us, information that can make a difference, a huge difference. Uh, so, so thank you so very much. Um, Amina, is there anything, you, I'll, uh, anything else you would like to share? I just want to thank all and everybody for this wonderful, wonderful panel and this knowledge we have to forward for the, to the people. It's, it's so important and I hope that we can have more and more events about environment because it's really so important topic and, and we have to tell the people that they understand that we have to take care about our planet Earth. It's now, not later, it's now. Later it will be too late already. So, so this is, thank you so much for all of you and everybody, all of you had a very important message and, and I'm so, so happy that it happened today. Thank you so much from my heart and you see this is heart's talk. That's why uh, all is coming from the heart. So thank you so much from my heart. Thank you so much for being thank here. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you and very much. Thank, thank, thank you, Linda. And bye bye. Yeah. And you. we will continue. We will continue. Uh, in September with a new series, but I will not tell you yet what kind of series, but it will come something out in September. So stay on tune. Yeah. Thank you Thank so you much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Have a Thank wonderful you. Thank evening. You. Bye. Thank you so much for hosting. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.